In June of 2012, on a sunny, beautiful summer day, a strange message appeared on a website belonging to the city of Yokohama, Japan. The message warned of an imminent act of mass murder at a local primary school. The Yokohama police was alerted and they quickly sprung into action, hoping to apprehend the culprit before they could commit to their act of terror. Surprisingly though, in almost no time at all, the police announced that the perpetrator of the terroristic act had been arrested and had confessed to posting the threats. Or should I say, perpetrators, plural. You see, over the course of the Yokohama police's investigation of this threat, four different people were arrested. Two of the individuals, a 19-year-old student and a 28-year-old man, confessed to having committed the crime, hacking the Yokohama website, and posting the threat. Just one month later, though, a similar threat would appear on the Osaka City website threatening to massacre innocents in the streets. This time, an anime creative director, Wan Masaki Kitamura, known for his work as an assistant director on Yu-Gi-Oh! and Mobile Suit Gundam, was arrested for committing the crime. Although Kitamura claimed he was innocent, he was nonetheless indicted and charged for the crimes. And seeing as how Japan has a 99.9% .9 conviction rate, well, it seemed like the Osaka police had caught their guy. After all, it was well known in Japan that only the very obviously guilty are ever charged due to the apparent efficiency and leniency of their criminal justice system. Despite this arrest and indictment, though, by September, the Tokyo, Osaka, Mie, and Fukuoka police departments had arrested another group of four different individuals on charges of obstruction of business in relation to the Osaka and Yokohama threats. The public seemed relieved that the cause of the threats had been handled, though surely it was odd that so many people of such different backgrounds, in such varying locales, might have worked together just to post vague threats on government websites without an apparent motive. The tide would turn on October 9th of that same year, flipping the Japanese legal system on its head. The real hacker sent an email to a high-profile Tokyo lawyer, one Mr. Yoji Ochiai and then additional emails to the Tokyo Broadcasting System and other media for confirmation. The emails were sent from an individual using the alias Onikoroshi, meaning Demon Killer. This name apparently so chosen because it also happened to be the name of a cheap sake, a cheap rice wine notorious for being a favorite beverage and symbol of police officers. The emails contained details only the criminal could possibly have known, explicit easy to corroborate details as to how the hacker had spread a Trojan horse via online bulletin boards and then remotely controlled host computers to post the threats. The apprehended individuals had had their computers hacked, leading investigators to believe that they had posted the threats themselves. Demon Killer would go on to state in their emails that their goal was not to hurt innocent people, but to entrap the police and prosecutors and to expose their so-called shameful status to the world. Hold it! We'll circle back around to this story in a bit. Let's talk first about Phoenix Wright. Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, is the story of the titular defense attorney, Phoenix Wright, as he navigates and uncovers wild conspiracies through the representation of his clients. Our Ace Attorney hero works with the police, goes on his own investigations, gathers evidence, and defends his clients, some of whom are interconnected with an overarching plot through both direct involvement or indirect bumbling, as the case may be. I, as an attorney myself, have always had a fondness for the Ace Attorney series. Now, if you've ever played Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney and are unfamiliar with the Japanese legal system, something may have immediately jumped out at you while playing the games. And no, I don't mean the involvement of teenage magic psychic sidekicks, nor the blatant disregard for criminal procedure or the rules of evidence. No, if you are not familiar with Japanese culture, what may have stood out to you was just how heavily stacked the deck seems to be against the defendants. Prosecutors act dishonestly and with brazen confidence. The public all seems to presume the accused is guilty, and even the defendants themselves, who know they are innocent, seem to worry about whether or not they are actually guilty. And indeed, defendant after defendant seems to have this same demeanor. The defendants in these games all seem to be unsure as to whether or not they're actually guilty, as if they cannot believe that they might be innocent despite knowing that they are. And it's not just the original Phoenix Wright either. This trope repeats again and again throughout the Ace Attorney series. 
And to those of us familiar with how court proceedings in the Western world go, this behavior is preposterous, frustrating, and even immersion-destroying. We imagine that these reactions are just cartoonish hyperbole. We scratch our heads and wonder why the characters behave in such a strange way. But for the Japanese player, there is a message interwoven here that hits closer to cultural home. To make a long, complicated matter very simple, Japan, like its East Asian neighbors, is a collectivist society. A society in which collective harmony takes precedence over individual liberty. And as such, Japan operates its legal system with different priorities than our legal systems in the West. Here in the global West, our legal systems are built to prioritize individual social justice in line with our philosophical heritage. Due process. Peace, order, and good government. Einigkeit und Recht und Freiheit. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Liberty and justice for all. In Japan, the legal system and constitution may have been largely put together by the United States after World War II, but the operation of the legal system and constitution continues very much in the vein of traditional Japanese thinking. Consider the Western political tenets above compared to those of Japanese philosopher Miyamoto Musashi. He writes, in his 21 rules, known better as the Dokudo, the following, indirectly concerning the concepts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As for the right to life, Musashi says, Michi ni oite wa shioito wa zuomo. Follow your path with preparedness for death. A fatalistic approach. On the right to liberty, Musashi says, Yoyo no michi wo somu kukoto nashi. Do not act contrary to the future before you. Or in other words, accept everything just the way that it is. On the pursuit of happiness, Musashi states, Isho no aida yokoshin omazu. Forget about human desire. And with regards to justice, Musashi says, Mio stetemo, mio ri wa stezu. Even if your life is jeopardized, you must not surrender honor. This philosophical tradition has strong ascetic Buddhist and Neo-Confucian influences, but we'll not get too deep into the philosophy. Instead, just understand this. Japan values collective social harmony over individual social justice, and the behavior of Phoenix Wright's clients his peers and the public in the Ace Attorney series can give us quite a bit of insight into how that value difference plays out in Japanese society compared to Western society. Let's revisit some of those clips we've seen now that we have some additional context. In the very first Ace Attorney game, Phoenix Wright is immediately put to task defending an old friend of his, Mr. Larry Butts, from a murder charge. I won't spoil the story for you, but let's review our clip of Defendant Butts interacting with Phoenix Wright. Although the Defendant is clearly panicking, this kind of statement is nonetheless unusual. Larry Butts knows he didn't commit the crime. He states as much, but there is an uncertainty in his actions and words. He is not vehemently defending of himself. He's doing exactly the opposite. He's blurting out to Phoenix that he is so guilty and insinuating that Phoenix should let him rot. Is this just the aforementioned cartoonish hyperbole? Maybe this is just how Larry Butts is. After all, when something smells, it's usually the Butts. But this is not the sole occurrence of this kind of behavior, and we see this behavior repeated in more serious defendants as well. We see, for example, prosecutor Miles Edgeworth charged with murder admitting openly to guilt in one such a scene. And in yet a different scene, we see another prosecutor, one Miss Lana Skye, charged with murder admitting to a crime that she did not commit. The defendants in Phoenix Wright games often know that they didn't commit the crimes they are being accused of. The defendants are being gaslit by the inherent nature of the system, manipulated psychologically into believing that they are crazy, that they are, in fact, guilty of the crimes they are charged with despite knowing that they aren't. In the world of Phoenix Wright, the defendants usually end up free. In real-world Japan, it is often not so. Remember that Japan has a 99.9% .9 conviction rate. Remember also the Demon Killer story. Two false confessions were extracted in a case that had garnered national attention in Japan. It's not as important that the criminal here gets caught or is brought to justice. It is more important that an example is made of someone to preserve societal harmony. 
someone must pay for the crime so that future criminals are deterred. And in so doing, justice is not necessarily carried out here. The true criminal may still be at large. Collective social harmony trumps individual social justice. The behavior of the prosecutors in Phoenix Wright can also provide some insight. Let's start with Miles Edgeworth, the game's most prominent prosecutor and rival of Phoenix Wright. Now to be fair to Mr. Edgeworth, he does change his behavior over the course of the first game and the rest of the series. This change of behavior is considered remarkable though because of how much it differs from the behavior of what the game presents as typical prosecutor behavior. Edgeworth gives us an example of that typical behavior when he states the following, There is no way to tell who is guilty and who is innocent. All that I can hope to do is to get every defendant declared guilty. Now to be fair, this mentality is not uncommon amongst prosecutors even in the West. Uh, trust me on that one. But Edgeworth goes above and beyond. He seems to have a close understanding with the judge and tampers with witnesses and evidence without any kind of rebuke. Edgeworth operates with a decisive edge over the defense to an even greater degree than that present in Western courts. We see this unethical behavior replicated later in the very same game through the behaviors and mannerisms of another prosecutor, one Manfred von Karma. Von Karma is a prosecutor who has gone undefeated for 40 years and is willing to go to extreme lengths to obtain his convictions. When von Karma appears in court, the judge is immediately convinced the defendant is guilty. After all, if the defendant wasn't guilty, would Von Karma even be willing to prosecute? It turns out, though, that Von Karma is willing to lie to the court, commit conspiracy, and even literally murder in order to protect his prestigious record of convictions. We meet Von Karma's daughter, Franziska, in a later game of the series. She too is a prosecutor, and she literally whips the judge in open court. A very subtle symbolism there. And though this is all played up for dramatic, video game, cartoonish effect, consider our demon killer story again. The police, prosecution, and courts expedited arrests and convictions. The deck is stacked against the accused. This exaggerated fiction is built upon a non-fictional truth. The Phoenix Wright games often have you, as the defense attorney, interacting with potential witnesses or involved parties in order to gather information. As one might expect, witnesses and involved parties tend generally to have a pretty opinionated view as to who the culprit might be. What is unusual though here is how these opinions lean so heavily in favor of a guilty verdict. The public seems to presume that every person being charged must be guilty. And sure, the biases can also exist here in the West, but in the West, the legal system at least purports to support the opposite, that all defendants have a presumption of innocence. In Japan, however, the legal system being focused on social harmony in practice, if not on paper, means that the accused are often guilty unless proven innocent. There is a presumption of guilt that exists in the core of the legal system, and this presumption carries over into the public consciousness. After all, if the conviction rate is 99.9% .9 and crime is relatively low, it must mean that the police only arrest the truly guilty and that the system works. The arithmetic seems straightforward and the solution seems functional, and so the public tends to forgive abnormalities. The collective social harmony is greater than the individual social justice. And so, what can we conclude? Well, Phoenix Wright games are a mirror of Japanese society, and Japanese society is- OBJECTION! Wait, but aren't there similar issues with legal justice in the West? Okay. While there are certainly similar issues in the West, putting aside the whataboutism issue, the West may be a more individualistic society, but it's not necessarily any better with regards to social justice, just different. If you're watching this video in the West, you may already have a very strong informed opinion on this topic as it pertains to your experiences in the West. I don't want to comment on these topics, however, as they are outside of the scope of this video on Phoenix Wright, and they are likely topics you are already informed about. Did you even play the games? Aren't some of these examples a reach? Okay, some of these examples are a reach, and they have additional story context, I will readily admit. 
But even given the fantastical plot elements and missing context, the cultural aspects and behaviors exhibited in this series reflect accurately upon Japanese society as they well should. It's media produced in Japan for consumption by a Japanese audience. Aren't there explanations available as to why the Japanese conviction rate is so high, and how perhaps we in the West are misinterpreting available information to come to a false conclusion about the Japanese legal system? Well, you can readily find on Wikipedia and other such places arguments as to why the high Japanese conviction rate is not as severe as it may first seem. Some of that may be apologia, but we won't get into that too much. Ultimately, though these issues in the Japanese legal system may not be as serious as I present them to be, or even as bad as they are in the West, they still do absolutely exist. And these issues are reflected in the Phoenix Wright games. After seven months of investigation and four false arrests, Demon Killer was finally arrested. The story of his arrest is a truly bizarre one. He'd sent the Japanese media a puzzle to solve. Demon Killer told Japanese media that he had placed a micro SD card on a cat's collar on the famous Enoshima Island, an island full of cats. Whoever found the right cat's collar would solve the case. And in what might seem like a bizarre twist, Demon Keller had actually done exactly that. He placed incriminating evidence regarding his actions on that micro SD card. The SD card was then located on the very same day of the announcement. On the card was the source code for the virus, and a security camera had caught footage of one Yusuke Katayama, a 30-year-old IT office worker moving suspiciously towards the card-bearing cat. Katayama was arrested, and after a roughly year-long trial, he confessed to the crimes in May of 2014. But this story isn't really about him. Not really. Although Demon Killer's story is fascinating, our primary interest in this story is what it reveals about the Japanese legal system. You may recall that early on in this story, a 19-year-old student falsely confessed to the crimes committed. The father of the 19-year-old student who confessed stated to the media that consideration to the family was what motivated his son to misrepresent the facts and confess. The father would continue by stating, It is impermissible that they, the investigators, arrested and laid a false charge against an innocent citizen, just a young boy, due to their negligent investigations. It is too much to bear when I think about what went through his mind when he confessed. How he was longing for evidence of his crime, but he had to give up. Note the wording, he had to. Social harmony over social justice. The Justice Ministry would reply by stating that most confessions are truthful and that they play an important part in convicting criminals. At the time of the incident, Despite this being national news of tremendous controversy, the BBC reported that the average Japanese person polled on the street stated that they still trust the police, with an average score of 7 out of 10. Social harmony over social justice. And to drive home the point about how deeply ingrained this philosophy is in Japanese culture, the father of the 19-year-old would go on to write, Receiving an official apology has been nearly impossible. The saddest thing is I, as a parent, even doubted his innocence. There exists on the nebulous spectrum of social harmony and social justice, some point of balance, some middle ground in which the interests of both are preserved without infringing too heavily upon the other. Although reaching such a point of perfect balance may be impossible, every step towards such a balance seems to be a worthwhile goal. This is a very complicated topic, of course. We've seen 
how the concepts of social harmony and social justice have clashed here in the West. We don't need to look to Japan to see how complex this problem really is. And so this video seeks not to criticize Japan per se, but to inform one as to the cultural difficulties the Japanese face in confronting this difficult topic. By learning from others, we grow ourselves. Special thanks to my friend Piercing Sight for his assistance on this video. And of course, Moon Channel would not be possible without viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, next episode, we'll cover something a little less serious. How about what Undertale and Deltarune's secrets can teach us about nihilism, free will, and human nature? I hope you'll stick around to find out. But in any case, I've been your host, Mooney. Take care out there, and thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel. <laughs>